This is Democracy Now! I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. As the Trump administration continues to defend firing tear gas into crowds of asylum seekers at the U.S.-Mexico border, we spend the rest of the hour looking at the history of tear gas, which is banned in warfare, but legal for federal authorities and police to turn on civilians. Border authorities' use of tear gas has spiked under the Trump administration, with the agency's own data revealing it has deployed tear gas over two dozen times this year alone. Customs and Border Protection told Newsweek Tuesday it began using tear gas under the Obama administration in 2010 and has released the substance 126 times since the year 2012. The agency's use of tear gas has now reached a seven-year record high under the Trump administration. On Monday, President Trump was asked about the tear gassing of women and children migrants. How did you feel when you saw the images of the women and children running from the tear gas? Well, I do say, why are they there? I mean, I have to start off. First of all, the tear gas is a very minor form of the tear gas itself. Uh, it's very safe. The ones that were suffering to a certain extent were the people that were putting it out there. President Trump claimed border agents used a minor form of tear gas. But Customs and Border Protection later acknowledged there's only one form of the gas that is commonly used. Ronald Colburn, the president of the Border Patrol Foundation and former national deputy chief of U.S. Customs and Border Protection, spoke on Fox and Friends Monday morning. The type of deterrent being used is OC pepper spray. It's literally water, pepper, with a small amount of uh, alcohol for evaporation purposes. It's natural. You could actually put it on your nachos and eat it. Uh, so it's a good way of deterring people without uh, long-term harm. You can actually put it on your nachos and eat it. Tear gas is banned by international law under the Chemical Weapons Convention. The American Academy of Pediatrics said in a statement, the use of tear gas on children, including infants and toddlers in diapers, goes against evidence-based recommendations and threatens their short- and long-term health. Well, for more, we go to Baltimore, Maryland, where we're joined by Stuart Schrader, lecturer in sociology at Johns Hopkins University. He studied how tear gas went from a weapon of war used in Vietnam to being deployed by law enforcement at home, his forthcoming book, Back Badges Without Borders, How Global Counterinsurgency Transformed American Policing. Stuart Trader, welcome to Democracy Now! First, respond to what President Trump and the head of the Border Patrol Foundation said about the tear gas and the fact that it was shot at women and children on the border by U.S. forces. Well, both of these statements are misleading. In the case of President Trump's statement, he is trying to claim that the tear gas is a mild form, and that's simply untrue. The tear gas that was used is a chemical called CS, and the guy from the Border Patrol is also being misleading because he's referring to pepper spray, and again, it was CS that was used. And CS is a extremely powerful chemical, and the term tear gas, when referring to CS, is misleading because it doesn't just make your eyes tear when when it when it affects your body. It also makes um, all of your mucous membranes become inflamed. You uh, expel large amounts of mucus. You cough. You feel like you can't breathe. Um, you feel like you're choking. So the the term tear gas doesn't really uh, describe the effects that are the result of this chemical. And what is the difference between pepper spray and tear gas? Well, they're chemically different substances, and they're, they're also um, the delivery methods are different. The CS that was deployed on the border came out of grenades, and it came, you know, most people saw images of these kind of clouds of smoke. Um, pepper spray is, is a more directed blast that is usually shot between, you know, one law enforcement officer and, you know, one, one person or a small crowd of people. Instead, the CS grenades that were used, um, they diffuse a large cloud of the chemical that, um, you know, can basically engulf anyone who's within the vicinity. 
Yesterday, I quoted Karen Atias, the uh, editor for uh, Jamel Khashoggi. She's the global uh, news editor at The Washington Post, saying that if uh, American media were describing, if this happened in a non-Western country, American security forces under the Trump regime use chemical weapons in a cross-border operation against unarmed asylum seekers, including children, my God. Um, so, Stuart Schrader, can you talk about the history of the use of CS gas? I mean, I don't think people understand. This gas that was used on the women and children who are fleeing persecution and poverty is considered illegal under the Chemical Weapons Convention? Yeah, that's correct. The, the history of CS is, is a fairly long history. The first ban on chemical weapons that was put into place was all the way back in 1925. And that did not cover CS, because CS had not yet been invented. Um, also, the United States did not ratify that, uh, that agreement way back when. Um, CS was invented a few years later, and it really came into much more widespread use and was adopted by the U.S. military um, in the late 1950s, early 1960s. Until that point, there was another form of tear gas that was used, again, acknowledging that the term tear gas is misleading. And the U.S. military phased that out. That's called CN. It phased it out over the course of the 1960s and replaced it with CS. And the reason was that CS was just much more severe and intense in its effects. And so beginning in the 1960s, the U.S. military started to use CS in its operations, predominantly in South Vietnam. And when this news hit, you know, newspapers in the United States in 1965 that the United States was using gas, um, the Johnson administration quite quickly tried to downplay the use of the gas. First of all, they wanted to make sure that everybody knew that it was not uh, violating any kind of international treaty that it was not using mustard gas or something along those lines. Um, but they also made the effort to downplay the severity of CS. And in this way, there's actually a strange parallel between Lyndon Johnson and Donald Trump, probably the only one that could be drawn, which is that they both have claimed that tear gas, CS, is not so bad. And so Lyndon Johnson, um, his Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense, they all claimed that the use of CS beginning in 1965 in Vietnam was no big deal and nothing to be concerned about. But in fact, the effects of CS at the time were severe, and CS came to be used in really, really large amounts, copious amounts, throughout the U.S. war in Vietnam during the 1960s. And how then did the use of CS uh, then uh, migrate to domestic police departments after 19, uh, especially after 1968? What was the, uh, what was the logic then of how that, uh, th that came about? Well, when it was used in Vietnam, it was used in two primary ways. Although it was often claimed that it was being used in the setting of riot control, that wasn't actually the case. In fact, it was used in combat, and one purpose was used to flush people out of hiding. So if people were hiding in bunkers or in tunnels or even just in you know, heavy vegetation, CS would be used to try to force them out, because, of course, the main problem for the United States military during the war in Vietnam was finding the people that they wanted to target as the enemy. So CS was used to force people out because the response that anybody would have to it is basically to flee, as we saw in pictures just the other day. So once people revealed their location, then the U.S. military could target them with, you know, more conventional weapons from airstrikes to bullets. And another reason or another purpose of, of, of CS was to then uh, contaminate those hiding spaces, bunkers and tunnels. They would be filled with CS, and um, then people couldn't go in them and hide after the U.S. military left. Now, these purposes were not the immediate purposes that were uh, used after 1968 in the United States by law enforcement. Rather, 
uh, it was used in riot control um, starting in 1968. Now, in 1967, there were, you know, large, well-known incidents of, of urban unrest in cities like Newark and Detroit. And the National Guard was deployed, and the National Guard in these incidents used bullets. They used rifles, and they shot a lot of bullets. Um, something like 10,000 bullets were fired and by the National Guard in Newark in 1967, and they fired no tear gas grenades. Now, if you fast forward from July of 1967 to April of 1968, when there was unrest after the assassination of Martin Luther King in cities like Washington, D.C., and Baltimore, and others, um, the National Guard fired less than 20 bullets, but they used something like almost 6,000 CS grenades. Now, the reason for this this really rapid and dramatic transformation in their tactics and riot control was that after the experience in the summer of 1967, the Johnson administration appointed the Kerner Commission, which did a really extensive investigation into the causes of the unrest and also into remedies for preventing it in the future. Now, of course, they recommended a remedy of, of, of alleviating poverty and racism, but that didn't happen. And instead, what did happen was that they had some recommendations about how to change policing, one of which was to use CS. And that recommendation mostly came from experts who were already working overseas in the setting of counterinsurgency um, and, and other types of of you know, counter-subversive activity. We clearly need a part two on this, but who makes CS? We have 15 seconds. CS is made by American companies uh, as well as other companies around the world. Well, I want to thank you for being with us. Stuart Schrader, lecturer in sociology at Johns Hopkins University, his forthcoming book, Badges Without Borders, How Global Counterinsurgency Transformed American Policing. Democracy Now! is produced by Mike Burke, Dina Guzder, Nermeen Sheikh, Carla Wills, Tammy Warrenoff, Sam Alkoff, John Hamilton, Ravi Karen, Hani Massoud, Trina Nandura, Tay Marie Estudio, and Libby Rainey. Mike DeFilippo, Miguel Nagara, our engineer. Special thanks to Becca Staley and Julie Crosby. Again, um, Juan Gonzalez tomorrow night will be at the Verso Loft at 20 J Street interviewing Dana Frank. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan.